Right. Um, let's talk about some stuff. So the most important, so there's the agenda for today. Um, let me save page so we can look at it in all its glory. Okay. So um, what I want to talk about today was, um, great, Quincy's here. Hey, Quincy. Okay, so hey. agenda for today. Uh, I got two things besides we can go take a peek at some of the um, the pull requests and issues and stuff. There's not much going on. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is somebody uh, filed an issue about propagating group creation properties to the um, intermediate groups when you tell the library you want us to create the intermediate groups, because right now they are not. And then um, got the float 16 RFC, which sorry for sending it out um, just now. I didn't realize I could send an email to everybody in the meeting. I thought I had to have a mailing list for that, but it turns out I could just mail everyone in the meeting. So that was pretty handy. Um, so yeah, so let's. Uh, Put this on edit here and then let's take a peek at uh let's see it is 3945. So this person is complaining that when they um turn on the create intermediate group, that the intermediate groups are not created with these group creation properties that they've created. Um like here, so they've got the set attribute creation order on the group properties. And so to them, it's weird that I'm saying create this last group. But then these ones that we kind of created in the middle to get to the last group do not get the group creation properties. list. And he said that that's weird. And I agree with him. I think that we should change this that any if you create a group and it's going to create two intermediate groups, it should all get the properties. And so but people did bring Does up that, that. But that that you have to be thoughtful a little bit because if you're creating a data set, what are the intermediate group properties? So it's creating yeah. it. Yeah. Because you could take like only object creation properties from the DCPL, but that gets a little wonky, I think. Yeah. I and mean, it would be sensible, yeah. But we'd have to promote these, whatever we think is an appropriate group creation property up into the object creation property class and then be able to check for it as we were iterating towards creating the groups to get to the data set. Yeah. That's going to be really weird. Slightly. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Let me get this package. Hmm. Yeah, we'll have to think about that. I think we've I feel like we've gone over this before. I don't remember what, I mean, obviously the resolution didn't involve changing it, but I, I feel like we've gone over this exact problem before. Anyone else remembered dealing with this? I feel like I might have some vague memories of it, but I don't remember it well enough to remember if uh, there was any kind of resolution or anything like that. You know, I wonder, just out of curiosity, let me uh, look at our old JIRA. I mean, we could add a new API to set an intermediate group GCPL or something. Um, let me look. Uh, group creation intermediate. Plus plus the help desk. Don't see anything. Yeah, I don't see anything in uh in, in Jira, so we we didn't create a Jira issue for it. But uh, do you remember this, Quincy? Did we ever talk about this in the past? Sorry, just the group creation one still. Yeah. Uh, I jumped out just as we were talking about moving into object creation, and now where did you end up? Oh. But Neil brought up that we we may have talked about this in the past. And I went and looked at Jira, and I don't see anything in Jira 
that involves the that involves this problem. Do you remember what it might have prompted? What the um, intermediate? I don't think this whole inherit the properties for the intermediate ones. It's come up to my knowledge. All right, maybe I'm misremembering. I just I just, I just thought like when I heard about it, it was the last last time it really like got a sense of deja vu. Yeah, okay. I mean, we did have a little bit of a go round around how do you get um, creation properties in the root group, and we decided to move group creation properties. That's why the property of this classes are the way they are, so that the file, when it creates the root group, implicitly can inherit the group creation stuff correctly, or the other way around, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of similar, so maybe that is the echo you're thinking of, Neil? Uh, I don't think it was that that long ago. I, I don't think I was at the company when when we did that. But yeah, I could just be conflating it with somebody else. Hmm. It needs some level of thought that says, hey, you know what, if you want to do this and those intermediate groups are going to get created, I guess you could attach a group creation but property list to some other objects creation property list and use that as the creation property list for intermediate groups sort of has a logical sense yeah uh, i mean i i suggested i think while you're away that we could add a new api set intermediate create intermediate group gcpl or something like that right yeah, yeah. Um, right. uh but all it just occurred to me that i might have been thinking of uh some something where like like the link access property list for intermediate for opening intermediate groups or something like that. Oh so yeah, yeah there's that coming up too. Sure. Yeah. How do we handle that now? Because we should do something at least conceptually close so that we keep with a pattern. I don't, I don't remember I how we, know it. we should do that. It's away from my computer, and I'll try and figure it out when I get there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I can look it up too, but on the fly. Mm -hmm. it's... Yeah, it should be consistent. Right. I think Neil and I suggested fundamentally the same idea, like attach a group creation property list to other things so that we can do the right thing for those intermediate groups. Mm -hmm. We could even version the HIP set create intermediate group API to add a GCPL. Well, the problem is, is it's kind of non-intuitive, and it, and it really doesn't. Um, I'm thinking of the data set case, right, where you're going to create the intermediate groups for a data set. Uh, so you've got to have some way to attach it to the data sets creation property list. HIP set the existing set in create intermediate group API. That's uh, that goes on a it was an OCPL or LAPL or something like that. It doesn't go on a GCPL. So that would work. With well, right, but that's just saying, please do create the the intermediate groups. It doesn't say what the group well, the group creation properties are for those, right? Right. Well, I'm saying that we can either add a, another API that is um, you know. Both yeah. in the same place, or, or we could version that API to add the GCPL, and if you don't want to use it, just HIP default. True. Okay. Yeah, I see where you're going with that. Uh, not a big fan of versioning that API, but it's sensible too. It, sure. Uh, yeah. Works. Okay. We'll have to discuss it and see what, especially after looking at the code to see what it does. We'll uh, come back to it. But yeah, okay. As long as we decide that it should apply those, mm -hmm. that's that's useful. Okay, so that's decision. We'll um, propagate the properties to the intermediate groups. Require some finagling to uh, deal with. Uh, 
All right, and then the other thing that I wanted to go over a little bit was, um, so Jordan has put together uh, beginning of an RFC to to add uh, 16 point bit 16 bit floating point types and complex number data types to HDF5. Um, so it's very short. Um, basically, there's there's two kinds. I think I actually want to do this, Trent. Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> um, so there's a couple of different data types here to consider. There's the float 16 normal, I guess, um, IEEE standard type. There's the brain floating point format, which was invented by Google for machine learning, which is also a 16-bit, but it changes a little bit. It it maintains the range of a 32-bit float, but it it's uh, loses a lot of um, precision. So you can see here it's got eight bits for the exponent and seven for the fraction. And then um, complex number types, which were proposed in the past, and uh, Jerome's RFC covered them, but uh, they were never really implemented. Um, so at least according to what people have kind of standardized on, um, there's this underscore capital F float 16 type, and that's what people suggest to use for 16-bit floats in C because uh, that's the type that will generally map to actual hardware instructions for working on the types. Whereas, uh, like I mentioned here, there's the, also this um, double underscore FP 16 type that is a little more generally supported, but what happens is when you do arithmetic on those, it gets promoted to float, and then uh, arithmetic happens, it's truncated back. So we really want to, want to support this float 16 type if we can, and the BF16 would be nice for machine learning going forward, and then complex types have been asked for for a very long time. Um, so I guess going down, Dana, to the, there's the section well, I added on before macros. You go into other yeah, go variants ahead, of things. Um, I would suggest uh, thinking about <clears throat> putting the bool support in here since you're adding new types, right? Yeah, got this one here too. Oh, okay. Maybe this is a, this is the older RFC from uh, oh, oh, oh. Jerome, okay. but we should we should add this in as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. because Good. we only added the the H bool type and not like a real bool. Yeah, it doesn't go in the file, right? It's not a data type, data type. It's just a runtime variable type. Yeah, there's no bool support. Right. I noticed yeah. that was, yeah, based on the size of an unsigned uh, short, I think, or an int. So it's not one bit. And it's just no, you know, HDF5, H5T native bool or anything right. like that. So, right. um, so that would be cool. The other one is at least throw a footnote in or an appendix or something that says, I looked at the FP8 implementations and they are or are not ready for serious support. Because a lot of the machine learning codes are thinking and using FP8s in various ways. What would be the use case for FP8s? Wouldn't it be pretty small for what they're trying to do? Uh, it's, it, you know, a lot of the machine learning stuff doesn't need a heck of a lot of bits. It's weird yeah. to me once, too. I agree. But. Once you've trained a model, um, you can get by with surprisingly few bits. Like they talk about having very small, you know, crunching a lot of these things for that. You know, the, when you have when you're training, you have a larger model and you would use like the bigger things and stuff. But when you are just trying to vet, like, is this picture of a cat or not? I mean, you can really shrink stuff down. Sometimes like integers go down to like two two bits. I mean, just like crazy stuff to to really shrink stuff down to where you can run it on small hardware like your phone or like a raspberry pi or something like that because there's, there's a lot of interest in doing machine learning at the edge like if you've got like a game camera and you want to take pictures of you know some rare animal that comes out at night you know it's better to vet the pictures before you send them over some super slow expensive satellite network right so they want to be able to do this stuff at the edge and run it off of a thing that's charged with solar power and stuff so okay well we can add it to the rfc i can tell you from all the compiler docs i looked at pretty much no one supports fp8 currently but um if that's right. the way things are moving then we can get ahead of it well that kind of is well and maybe you're going to get there in a little bit but the other place i would suggest is taking a, a you didn't seem to include um commentary about uh the nvidia compilers 
Oh, yeah, I should look at that as well. I, I tried to pull out the main ones. I have not looked at NVIDIA's support for that yet. And that might be where there would be more discussion about FP8. Yeah, and Intel actually, they split off their one API into this component they call one DNN, which is the deep neural network framework they're working on. And the lowest they seem to have gone so far is FP16. Um, I didn't see any discussion around FP8, but I will look at uh, the NVIDIA docs for that too. Yeah, okay. I think I can hold my next set of comments for further down. Sorry, those were the <laughs> first set. Yeah, sure. Um, so here I just talk about some of the new macros that be added, which would basically be, um, you know, the native ones for all the types that the native platform has a representation for. And then there's also the, so I don't know what to really call these, but for the brain floating point, you also want to have like the standard types. Um, so I left big Indian and little Indian in because we've done that before for floating points. I don't know how much we still care about big Indian, but you know, might as well throw it in here so we can discuss it. And then I also had the same for the float 16 type. Um, well, there, yeah, those all made sense, but the complex ones, you would think perhaps that there should be little and big Indian variants as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, probably. I based this off of what Jerome did in his RFC. I didn't know. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know what support for that for big Indian, little Indian looks like for complex types. But yeah, it seems reasonable. Well, yeah. yeah, in the file, we're going to have to say, and this is little Indian or big Indian, right? The bytes right. on the disk, because it, each platform might be different and native doesn't mean anything in the file. Right, right. So I guess if you scroll up a little bit, Dana, my first question that we should probably discuss, um, how do we want to handle when platforms don't have supports for these native types? I basically see two approaches. Um, we can either have these macros map to an invalid ID and basically they get an error if they don't have the type, or we can always create the type and operate under the assumption that the user has to understand, you know, what the type is, and if they send a buffer that's not in that type, they're going to have problems. Oh, what do you mean? Get native type or something else? So, so like this macro for native float 16, right? So not all platforms support, support this float 16 type, and especially not Microsoft. So if somebody doesn't have a native type, they can still pass in a buffer assuming it's in this binary 16 format, they just have to understand that the library's expecting them to do that. Or if they don't have a native type for float 16, we can just map it to an invalid ID and they, they'll get an error on write or read. Oh yeah, I would just, you know, if they don't have a compiler type that corresponds, they don't have a native foo, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Yeah. So and you we just map it in, to IEEE little Indian F16, blah, 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 right? And they say, you know, I know what my buffer is. My buffer is exactly this. Then you're fine, right? But since there isn't a native type by the compiler for us to probe and, and learn what the nativeness is, there's, there's no possibility of us providing a macro to mm -hmm. describe it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it raises some interesting questions here, like in the discussion I put above for the float 16 type, their native type on the platform could either be this float 16 if they actually support that, or it could be the double underscore FP16 that uh, gets promoted to float when doing arithmetic on it. So if either one's available, should we still map the macro to whatever that is? Because they should be the same format. They just have different characteristics in terms of the arithmetic. So the, like the underscore float 16 behavior is different is what you're saying? Right. Or... They're both the binary 16 IEEE format, but this underscore float 16 here, when you do arithmetic on it, it's actually done in 16-bit uh, precision. Whereas if you only have the double underscore FP16, it's still in memory in this format. But when you do arithmetic on it, compilers promote it to float and then truncate back. Okay, wait, I don't see that one in your list. It's, I, it's, I get the above. it's not here, but it's in the, um, where I talk about float 16 there, there's this underscore oh, FB 16 type. Yeah, well, I would so, make that be its, its own different type. 
if we want to support it, we can just punt it and say, no, sorry, this is too weird. Um, or support it later or something, right? But if you're going to support something specific that's the compiler keyword, then yeah, do that. Okay. So do basically, one or the other, but not all. Mix, don't the, overlap. The, um... C standards committee at least suggest everyone should use this underscore float 16 because it's faster and more standardized and all that stuff. So if we're doing a native float 16, we should always just check for this float 16. If they don't have it, we just say, you know, okay, you don't have that type. So then macro just maps to bad. Yeah. And someday later we could add a FP 16 type and, you know, I think that's rare, but and do all those same things for it with just a different name, right? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Microsoft is really the only holdout here. They're the ones that are a pain when it comes to all this because they don't support Float 16. Right. And I don't even know if they support the underscore FP16 and then their complex number support we'll talk about because they're fun. Um, but okay, that's, that's good to answer the first question. And then the second one I had, which is just below that, um, we should decide what the on-disk format for these complex numbers is going to look like. Um, I'm thinking the struct with two members seems to be the most commonly used everywhere and is probably best for compatibility with people that don't have a real good uh, you know, native platform support for complex, but we should figure out if that's the best way to go with these. Can people hear me? Yeah, I guess yeah, you can hear yeah, I've been trying to uh, trying to say something for a while. Uh, so for the FP16 versus Float16, is the the only distinction is the uh, the precision that the the math is done in, and the the actual binary format is the same. Right. Right. So I mean, unless you're doing a transformation, then it doesn't make a difference in terms of how HDF5 handles it, right? Shouldn't. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, right. I don't We're see splitting out ones and zeros. We don't care. Would it would it be hard to just add both of them? Uh, I don't think it would be any harder than the other. We can detect support. I mean, we can figure out a name for the macros and whatnot. But um, the underscore float sixteen is definitely far more better supported across different platforms. The FP16 is mostly only well supported on ARM and only 32-bit ARM because 64-bit ARM uh, natively supports um, the float 16 type. So we could add it. It's not well used. I think you're just asking for more work if we add that one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, not strongly opposed and just wouldn't do it right off the bat. As far as I could tell, um, Intel has its own F16 type, which seems to map directly to hardware instructions. It, right, it gets real fun real fast. Um, the Float 16 is the most widely supported everywhere and is, is standardized by um, the ISO whatever number I put there. So that's the best one to support. And FP16, as far as I could tell, is mostly just on ARM and 32-bit only. So not super common, but we can add it if we decide we want to. I would say like no, we should at least mention it in the RFC, and then I would I would implement the most commonly used stuff. And if people yell at us, you know, in a release or two and say, hey, why didn't you support this? Then we could think about adding it in. But right now, is there a strong use case for a 32-bit ARM? I mean, mm -hmm. Even like Raspberry Pis are 16, they're 64-bit now, so I don't really. I mean, you could even you could even mention it in the RFC, like Dana says, and give a recipe for declaring a software-defined, you know, runtime-defined and if you really wanted to, here's how I, you should describe a whatever, a few of these variants um, with the API calls to, to describe where the bits are in memory. That way the mm -hmm. users could at least describe a buffer and have it type convert to something in the file that was IEEE F16BE or something, right? Right. Uh, what Jordan says is that, is that the binary format is the same between the two. So right, they're exactly the same. Well, no, I meant yeah. the it's Intel one. Is the Intel one identical also? Oh, yes. Yes, they're all, they all follow the IEEE um, 
what is it? I, I put the reference in here. It's the IEEE binary 16 format, but everyone has their own platform type names for it because they want to be fun. Okay. I would so even they, maybe consider punting the BF16 down the line into an appendix and say, you know, hey, we thought about this one, and here's how you set this up in memory if you want to do it at runtime. And if there's really big demand, we could consider adding a thing. I would just do the standard one. Is the BF16 really for TensorFlow? Like all that brain It's, it's machine stuff. learning and sensor data mostly where people want um, – want the range of a 32-bit number but with less precision so they can store it in you know 16-bit floats on disk um and i put a link uh above to the the Goog or the wikipedia entry where google um their little department talked about you know why they invented it and what it's for and everything um that mark k guy was the one who uh said it would be nice to support it so i decided to throw in a reference here but yeah th this is all just you know proposal stuff we don't have to implement really anything but Float 16 is the main one we're going after, but BF16 is probably going to be, you know, widely used going forward because um, Google uses it on their new, what they call their TPU units. They're using it heavily in the cloud for acceleration and things like that. So, Yeah, but again, good. I would take a look at the NVIDIA ones because NVIDIA still has a gazillion times the market share of, you know, um, Google's TensorFlow things or Amazon's, you know, in for Yeah, I've heard so. that TensorFlow is kind of like on the outs because they botched that upgrade from one to two and made so many people annoyed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's it's here for discussion, so we can think about it. Um, but yeah, so we should figure out what we want complex numbers to look like on disk. Um, Everybody has created their own kind of crazy ways, but the, the three most common I've seen so far is a struct with two members, which is reasonable. Uh, somebody did an array with two elements, which is also reasonable, but kind of weirdish, I guess. And then somebody else made a, um, a data set where an extra dimension represented the imaginary part. And that one seems obviously not very great. So... I'm leaning towards the struct type, but you know, if anybody has any ideas on what would be better for compatibility, maybe in the on-disk format. Well, I wouldn't define it as. I mean, it's an atomic type. You should define it as an atomic type with a layout that happens to have two values in it. All right. But don't put in a struct. Don't put in an array. Don't make a wrapper around it. Yeah. It's a real type. Yeah. Uh, what were you saying, Neil? In, oh yeah, I was basically I I was I was trying to ask if if you were planning to make it as sort of like a high level abstraction of an existing uh, facility, like like a compound or a array. But yeah, I mean that's that have... seems to be how people have gone in the absence of us having first class support for it. Um, right. Everybody mostly does compounds, but. Yeah, so people can already do that. So yeah, we should add a first class type. Yeah, and then there, I was going to suggest adding in some common uh, type conversions to you know the array thing or the uh, compound type. Yeah, even that's if reasonable. they're just example code, we we ship and say, hey, you know what? If you did this, here's how to get it into a native thing. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, if it was if I was going to go with a struct, it was basically going to have to always be, uh, you know, a conversion to whatever the compiler's complex type is at runtime. But if we go with an atomic type, that may be faster. But then, yeah, we want to support converting to struct because that's what people seem to commonly be doing for complex numbers currently. Yeah. Well, they're only doing that because that's the only option we give them. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, there should right. be at it's least one popular code. platform where it's a zero copy, right? Whatever the format on disk is identical to the format in memory. And probably that's a little Indian Intel scenario. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what GCC's looked... binary and memory layout looks like, if it's two floats next to one another like that all the time, then, you know, go for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that for, for the for a native complex, but we should be able to define your own complex by you know saying it's a complex and here's the base type, 
is an int or, or a quote 16 or whatever. Yeah, I don't know how that, that's going to be probably a couple of new API routines because we know well how, I and mean, we've got all the definitions spelled out for here's where all the pieces of a floating point number go. Um, but a compound in memory may have some additional degrees of freedom that um, we might need another API routine or two. We've got to allow for people to specify 13 bit floating point, big Indian complexes, right? Well, annoyingly. I mean, yeah, for, for C99 at least, it's float. Uh, double and long double, and then GPC supports complex of any types, even though they say it's probably not super useful. I don't know about Clang and other support there, but uh, I was mostly just looking at the three standardized ones for now. Yeah, I mean, we could add that, that kind of flexibility in neighbor if we wanted to do it. So how does uh, an atomic type like this work in a library, uh, an atomic type that just consists of two parts? I mean, would it just be, I mean, basically the size of two floats next to each other as one atomic type, and then the library has to figure it out? You're breaking new ground. We don't know. And that's why I said. <laughs> yeah, my, that, that's what I would do. I would assume that that's what it's going to have to be inside the type of a machine. I can speak to that. Uh, in C11, you're allowed to have atomic structures. Uh, if they are too big for the underlying hardware to handle atomically, the compiler protects them with a mutex, and so the whole thing runs as if it were atomic. The size limit is, on the more modern machines, 128 bits, which I think would be big enough. Yeah, but we're not talking about that's atomic long access. Doubles. We're just talking about something else. Um, but, okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I as long as it's an atomic type, basically on disk, I think that makes yeah. There will be several platforms that will probably be able to support this natively because I'm assuming the representation of memory with this complex type is basically just two floats next to each other. I haven't really looked at what it's like in GCC, but. Um, yeah, okay. I will experiment with that and see what that's going to look like. Yeah, um, part of the reason why we kept punting it was like, I don't know. Uh, you know. Well, yeah, the struct is easy, right? But then you, you basically always have to do a conversion because it's, you know, compound to the in memory that's probably just two floats next to each other. So you're pretty much always having to do a conversion, um, which isn't ideal, but... Um, I feel like the struct would be better for compatibility for people that don't have don't support complex, like certain platforms that haven't caught up to the world. But um, hopefully, we That's can do the conversions we, reasonably. Yeah, if you just provide the conversions in a sensible way, and yeah, okay. Um, as for anything else on the RFC, um, I don't think there's anything else that really needs to be discussed at the moment, but I talk a little bit about just briefly about the conversions and stuff around the library infrastructure. I haven't really fleshed any of that out yet because it's less important. Um, and then in the appendix uh, below, um, I talked a little bit about the portability of the, the types across different platforms. Um, it's past revision history data. So here I just talk about the different types and how they're supported across the different compilers, which might be interesting to some people. And then, um, uh, yeah, so complexes are super fun because they introduced them in C99 as mandatory. And then in C11, they decided people, they wanted people to support that standard, so they made them optional. And they have this feature test macro, but it only shows up in C11, so you can't reliably tell from C99 unless you start testing some types. And then they have this macro, this 6559 complex, which if it's defined, um, the library or the compiler supports some extra stuff around complex. And GCC apparently just defines that because they want to, and there's a lot of fun things around complex. 
So yeah, they're entertaining. And then I also started on a couple examples of what using the new types would look like, which is very straightforward. Um, I put those below the portability, but it's basically just, you know, create a data set and use the standard type for storage of S16 Little Indian. But uh, I'll add a couple of those as I go on. I think you're, um, one thing with the tools, you'll have to, or you should, update the DTD doc for describing, you know, what the, I think, XML or the, the textual formatting for these new types is, but that should be obvious. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just to be be in a kind of notation. <laughs> Another one, I think you're actually going to have to sit down and make a little matrix for the type conversions for the complexes. Because I believe the sensible thing to do is enable atomic floats and ends to complexes where the real part gets, uh, you know, if you're going too complex, the source is the real value and the imaginary component is zero. That's the typical right. one. And Jerome talks about this too in his RFC. Okay. I just didn't put it there for brevity. But, you know, if you're going from complex to, uh, you know, float, for example, you're going to chop off the imaginary part, um, okay. things like that. So, okay. all right. So yeah, that's, that, that's why in the conversions, I just put a sentence like, hey, I'm going to add conversions because Jerome already talks about, yeah, you need to add hard conversions between all the different integer and float types and whatnot. So I didn't really want to repeat have to it. Think about Boolean also. Mm -hmm. All right. If we want to add support, you know, I'm mostly doing this for machine learning stuff. So I care mostly about F16. But um, yeah, sure. I mean, if we're in the guts, we can probably throw another type in. I just meant, you know, what does a complex map to a Boolean and backward? Uh, anyway, sure. Cool. Yeah. That's a good, it's a really good start. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the discussion I had. Um, I will look into the atomic uh, on disk type for complex and see how bad that's going to be. But um, otherwise, I think it's mostly going to be straightforward. It's just going to take some time writing tests mostly. Cool. Okay. So if I could get in for a question, just sure. to expose my own ignorance. From the sounds of it, things get a little bit strange with uh, C support for uh, complex. So definitely worth my time to go dig into the uh, C standard documents on this. Um, Dana, can you go back to the RFC real quick where I talk about the portability of the types? Uh, yeah, so down where complex starts. Um, yeah, you can go to the next page. So GCC basically fully supports these and has since 4.0. Um, Clang should support these just as well. Uh, Microsoft does support complex numbers, but they don't adhere to the C99 standard because, of course, they're Microsoft. So they have these new types, underscore F complex, D, and L complex that map to the C99 type, so you have to kind of, you know, wrap around them to get the same behavior. Uh -huh. And then uh, Intel One API, they stay, say that they're C99 compliant, so they should um, support these. But uh, any anything that wants to use these should check if the C standards at least 11 or higher, and if so, they should check this. Uh, standard C no complex macro. And if it's one, that means that the compiler doesn't support complex. And if it's zero, it should. So um, for the most part, they're supported everywhere, but Microsoft is the special child like usual. Uh huh. Now, of course, I've never paid much attention because complex is obvious. It's just an array of two floats. Uh, is there more going on in the implementations that I need to know about? I haven't looked into what they actually look like in most of the compilers. I'm assuming mm -hmm. they're they are basically just two floats or doubles or whichever right next mm -hmm. to each other. Um, but I don't I don't think that's really guaranteed. So they can do about whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, micro, there's some C99 functions around manipulating them. So you know it gives the compiler freedom to implement these types however they want. Um, but in general, I think the standard says that if you support 
complex types, then general arithmetic like addition and subtraction are defined on them. And if you want to do more complex stuff like cosines and whatnot, you should go through the standard math functions on them. Okay. All right. Well, I've been digging into the standard documents for other reasons. So I think I should go take a few hours to go take a look. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. We've got a few minutes left. Let's go take a peek and see if there's anything new in the issues. Uh, let's see here. So what was last? Last week was the 18th. Okay. Let's see here. So that was that one that we just looked at. Uh, yeah, this is weird. So Doxygen is including continuation characters. So uh, you can see that I think here. Uh, continuation characters. So we'll have to figure out how to do that because this is our formatter does this. So we can't not have these things. Um, hmm, we'll have to figure this out. Uh, and let's see, this is from Scott was looking at this. This one here. Oh, yeah, this is the one where uh, our MPI info is just the integer and it should be the new type. Type MPI info. Is that right, Scott? It's could be either or, yeah. Okay. It depends on what module you're using. Okay. Yeah, and I saw you had a, a PR in there. Yeah, I have to redo it. Apparently, the type that they introduced is not C interpretable, so I've got to go back to do it the old way. Oh. I assumed it was. It, it is an M pitch, but it's not an open MPI. So and I guess the standard says it's not supposed to be, but it doesn't, it doesn't require it to be, so I have to go back to using a C stub. Okay. And let's see here. We had some other stuff. Let's see. So. You learn string message documentation. Oh, that's that's approved. We'll get that in there. Um, uh, that so. one, I, I, there was some oh, discussion. Some I on this, about yeah. a couple people. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Just okay. because the library, like, we always refer to, like, a variable length of something. Uh, we consider the something as a parent type, which seems backward to me. But, you know, it's <clears throat> the library goes back and forth on these because the like the vlength create uh, API, when you give it the base ID of the type you want it to contain, it calls it base ID and base type, but also throughout the library, some places call it parent type. So I uh, was just kind of discussing with Matt, we should, you know, pick one and stick with it everywhere, I guess. Yeah, we should. I mean, that's like committed versus named data types, right? Those are kind of used interchangeably and we should just use one. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at this. We'll see what we can, what is best. And then let's see. So then, did you add task out? Test, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I okay. added a test. Cool. Okay. I get that in. Um, let's see here. To release notes. Oh yeah, I saw this. Um, and it's breaking for one API. And MSVC newer ones, I think. I think it's a pretty easy fix. I think they're just yeah, they're using an old CMake construct, and I think it's getting confused. Yeah. Okay. That fixed. Um, let's see. Oh, and then this. I don't know what this is. So it could be used locally. <clears throat> oh, I see. So they want to have just that code spell RC that file. I guess that's fine. I mean, that'd be handy for running it locally so I don't trip over it every time they update the dictionary. Just run it locally and check for stuff. I mean, I guess it's fine. So it's going to get picked up by code spell me, which it should. So that's fine. I'll say OK. Uh, that previous MSVC one 
we were talking about it this morning, and I don't think Alan thought the condition was quite what it should be. So, um, he chimed well, in. Well, actually, I think he requested changes on the pull request. Yeah, use MSC version. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then let's see, then there's Scott's as the effect, and then what is this? Just some go to I macro know. funness. Do the wrong thing. Yeah. For lack of an, uh, a good C testing framework. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Okay, so that's all we have for, uh, for pull request and uh, issue excitement. Does anybody have anything else you want to talk about? All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Let me uh, save this here. Discuss uh, RFC already, right? Sorry, I was late. Oh, 16? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. I'm sure we'll, we'll have another iteration of that once we've done more um, detective work and thought a little more. Okay. Yeah, okay. I just skimmed through it. Looks uh, uh, Content looks good, except that there's not much content. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, outline, outline, I think, outline but, looks good. Yes. Yeah, it's it's important to get this in, and we should find some. We we need to find a guinea pig to test this stuff out to see how this works with the machine learning pipelines. You can talk to uh, probably that Mark K guy because they they were, I mean, they had made a big request for this on the Julia side. Okay. We can do that. Okay. Thanks for everyone coming, and I will see you guys next week.